This webinar explores the advanced curriculum from Vanderbilt University's Programs for Talented Youth. Authored by Drs. Tamara Stambaugh, Emily Mofield, and others, this curriculum series is available from Proofrock Press. Back and let me introduce our our tremendous speaker today, Tamara Stambaugh. She is a uh, associate research professor in special education and director of programs for talented youth at Vanderbilt University. She runs their day residential talent development uh, program. So like, that means like, you know, in non-COVID time, she's got a thousand kids running around that campus uh, at any given moment. She supervises a staff of, of 50 with graduate students. Uh, and she is, as I, I mentioned before, a prolific author, an author of textbooks, journal articles. She was a co-author of the Jacob's Ladder series. She is a, a co-author of the Affect of Jacob's Ladder series. And she's a co-author along with others of the uh, Vanderbilt curriculum. Uh, she is also the newest release that she has from, through Proof Rock Press is Unlocking Potential, Identifying and Serving Gifted Students from Low-Income Households. Uh, prior to this, and to give, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit, but prior to this, she was at uh, the College of William Mar and Mary, where she was the Director of Grants and Special Projects, and she got her, her doctorate there at William and Mary under Joyce Ventassel Bosca, who I think I'm sure will come up as, as we get to talking. Um, let me give a, just a little elevator pitch of what these units are. So this curriculum series helps students develop advanced textual and media analysis abilities. And I, I want to be clear about that. We're not just talking about books. We've got videos, YouTube videos, different 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 formats that, that kids can take content and do the analysis of that content. Uh, sh through these, these books, we're engaging higher order thinking skills. They are thematic in nature. They're, uh, they, we call them ELA units, but they're essentially integrated units that also pull in the areas of science and social studies. Um, so uh, these are, are such engaging units and, and they're so fine for, uh, uh, for, for gifted learners. And the originator of this curriculum is uh, Tamara Stambaugh. Tamara, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah, th thanks for being here, Stan Tamara. I appreciate it. And let me, before I launch into asking you some questions, let me put this landing page up that I would mentioned earlier. So we created this, uh, this landing page, the uh, uh, proofrock.com Vanderbilt units. And I'll, I'll show you what this is. If you would, I can't leave this up forever, but if you could just take a screenshot of that URL, if you, if you, if you can't copy it down right this second, but this, this takes you to a special page in our, um, uh, in our on our website, let me let me pull it up uh, real quickly. So on this page, this fleshes out the different uh, curriculum that we 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 produce that that Tamara and her team have developed. Uh, it discusses the the different sort of what what comes with the curriculum. Uh, it talks about the research base and the standards based aspects of the curriculum. Uh, it talks a little bit about how to use the units in the classroom. But then it then you've got these uh, areas here, the grade bands that the the units. Um, uh, the unit hit hit upon. So uh, I think this is this is a really nice primer to what are what are in the units and, and which units might be right for you. Uh, Tamara, uh, so uh, you've published. I, I mean, I, as I've just demonstrated, you've published several of these units with co-authors. They, they at, at some level, they're ELA units, but then they pull you pull in science and social studies. Do you use specific curriculum models or theories to help with that unit design and, and what influences the unit development that you as you work? Yeah, thanks. So a couple of things. First of all, yes, definitely I use a lot of different models and I think that's really important. It's challenging, I think, to just write curriculum in a vacuum without understanding a theoretical framework. And so I started off with the units and a curriculum cohort because I also believe teachers are closest to kids in the classroom. And once you know I moved into higher ed, I'm I really missed the classroom and I wanted to work with some other teachers. And so we started off with these curriculum units um, as a cohort and asked different people, hey, if you want to write curriculum, I'll show you some different models. We'll put these together. And then we that way we know what kids like as well as what teachers need in the most user friendly way. But then I also know that it's there's our there's our theoretical concepts behind it. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. I think it's easier to show you than it is to talk through it. 
And so, of course, Dr. Van Tassel Baska, who is one of my favorite people in gifted and especially in curriculum, I moved um, from an administrative coordinator job specifically to work with her at William and Mary. And I believe her model is one that's influenced and influences the curriculum that I continue to write. It's had over you know, 30 years of research in the field now with published units that go along with this model. And so I don't know that we could get any better than this. And so what you'll see here is we have this accelerated component that we know is really important for gifted students. So what you'll see in all of the units is advanced content. So it's accelerated, whether it's the resources that are accelerated, a couple of grade levels above where most, you know, like what a typical, for example, third grader or whatever grade was targeted in the unit might be. Um, but we also have accelerated standards. So we're looking, um, we use the common core standards as a jumping point, but also um, you will pull in some other standards as well. And so for ELA, we look at Common Core, we look at the um, National um, Science Standards as well, and or the Next Generation Science Standards, and then we look at different social studies um, concepts. And then when we look at process and product, which is the second part of her model, um, it's not it's one thing to just accelerate the content, but if you're accelerating the content, but you're still asking these low level questions, it's not going to be as powerful as if you're accelerating the content and you're asking these harder questions as well. And so we, in all of our units, I make sure that we have um, depth, complexity, and creativity um, represented. And the way I define depth is um, add a debatable question and examine it through multiple perspectives. Complexity in the unit is defined as add a variable and examine it um, through and examine different relationships that go along with it. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a little while. And you can see over here, the thinking strategies that go with it. So we have dif these different wheels that I'll show that I can talk about um, if you want a little bit later. And, um, but really the goal is to think like an expert. You'll also see these issues or problems in the field that students may um, grapple with. And then we use um, for creativity, we try to look at real world problems with specific criteria that students have to look at. And then finally, all of the units, lesson one in almost every unit is starts off with a conceptual framework, just like uh, the William and Mary units do. And so we're not, it's, there's something to connect everything conceptually. So we, it may be truth or truth um, versus perception or power or interactions, but there's this hook that cuts across and helps sort of tie all the different units together um, or lessons together. So that's the biggest influence. But I also think what makes us unique, it's not just coming up with the William and Mary units. I was able and you were sort of mimicking them. But since those units and the model were developed, we've learned a lot more just about how do you develop expertise and how people learn. And so this is another book or really three books that have influenced a lot of what I've been able um, to do and how we've built the unit. So we wanna make sure that we're developing expertise. So we wanna look at complexity through the lens of an expert. And we know that um, in terms of how people learn, they learn by connecting ideas to the world. They And experts tend to link a lot of different facts together to come up with these generalizations or concepts. So let's teach students that early, which is why we have lesson one in all of our units as the conceptual frame. And then we wanna make sure we're very discipline specific. So what does it mean to think like a scientist, to use the models and vocabulary of um, an historian or of a literary analyst or of a writer? And so that's where that complexity comes in. But then we also have um, sections where we want students to make sure they're reflecting up on what was learned because we know as part of developing expertise, reflection, discussion, feedback, asking new questions is really important. And then, of course, some of us are very familiar with the um, talent development as a frame for gifted. And I have a chapter in this book. And one of my another I'm a, also a big fan of um, Paul Shevsky, Kavilias, Frank Worrell, and Rena Sabotnik and their work on talent development, which has really influenced a lot of what I've done recently. And so when we think about like how we want to differentiate within curriculum using a talent development frame, 
we need to think about the content, the process, the product, and the concepts like we know about in differentiation. But what does that mean in talent development? It really all focuses on this idea of expertise. So in content, what expertise does the content address? Who already knows it? Who could learn it more quickly? So you'll see some differentiated pieces in the unit as well, or the process that's, and it's not just the content, but even the psychosocial pieces, which are really important. So we have a section on social emotional needs and questions that we might ask students about. And um, so we want to know, like, what would an expert do in this situation? What skills are necessary for success? Like, what happens when I don't understand and this is really hard? How can I think about this? Or how would an expert use this? What models or tools would they create? Which then leads us to this idea of a product. And I always joke because you experts probably aren't going to make a macaroni um, your picture of something, but they might make a model or they might create some other kind of, um, of products. And so we try to make sure that the products we're asking students to create are products of experts that have specific criteria. And then we want to link it to these rules and theories and ideas in a field making them content specific, giving them exposure to what experts would think about early on, and then making sure that we're moving students on that continuum of you know, more challenging uh, work as they progress and learn more. And then probably the, the final thing that has really influenced the units and my thinking about curriculum is some of Bishop's work on this idea of mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And I don't have time to show you this YouTube video, but you can, I put a link here if you just wanted to screenshot it or write it down really quick. But I would recommend listening to her conversations about that and the importance of having curriculum that has mirrors that students can see themselves, windows that they can see the um, other people who aren't like them, and also sliding glass doors. So you're constantly coming in and out and moving between the two. And it's um, and everyone needs to learn about everyone else or have these other perspectives. So we've tried to include that in all of our curriculum. So those are really like sort of the four big key frames that I use as I think about curriculum development. No, thanks, Tamara. I appreciate that. I, I, um, so I'm thinking one of the things, you know, you and I have both been so influenced by Dr. Joyce Van Tassel Bosca and she, her original conception of that, the content-based models. And, and, and that, those models are very powerful because they are a part of developing expertise, uh, part of talent development. Uh, they're, they're part of differentiating instruction for kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could drill down a little bit right now and, 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 and ask you to provide some examples of different content areas and also discuss how, uh, how the units could be differentiated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so a couple of things, we have a lot of models and you'll see, I'm probably because I'm a disciple of Joyce and you know, like she, I really appreciated in all of the units that William and Mary had that you, you she, there are these consistent models. And I think that's really important. And I can talk a little bit about why here in just a second, but we look at that really, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier with how does an expert think about something? And so when we think about this through the lens of complexity, I've tried to simplify this a little bit. So what does complexity mean? Add something meaningful and examine the relationships or interactions. Because what we've done is we have all these different, within the units, these different wheels. And the wheels are really the models of thinking. And it started um, with um, Emily and Mofield. And I started off looking at some of these. And um, she was one of the first individuals to participate in this cohort. She's now a professor at Lipscomb and has also written some proofrock books. And so we started looking at these um, different lessons when she was still teaching middle school and these different models. And then I went and I talked with um, other people like in different departments who had PhDs in this area to say, how do you think about analyzing literature? Or I would go um, talk to an historian. I'll show you the end of social studies wheel in just a minute or different scientists. How do you think about this? And then I just took a lot of notes and then we'd come back and we would start to look at these models. And then almost every expert said, 
it's not in isolation. Everything we do is really complex. So we want to show students this too. And so what that means is we have these different wheels or models, and you'll see these arrows everywhere. So what happens is sometimes we may say, well, what's the setting? What are, what's the structure of the story? What's the plot? Let's, you know, first, next, finally, what point of view is it told from? Who are the characters? What's the theme? And those are all important things for students to know. But if we want to really teach them to think like an expert, experts look at all of these things simultaneously. And so that's what we want to break down. And so what we might want to do then is say, we might start off with sort of this level one, what's the plot? Who are the characters? What are some character traits that you notice? What's the setting? But we really want to make it complex and we want to start combining these multiple boxes on the wheel. And so you'll see within each of the units, you'll see sort of these simple questions to start out to make sure students understand, but then we write all of the questions for you because we also understand what it's like to be a teacher. And sometimes you don't have time to think up all of these different questions and pre-plan those advanced questions that are so important. So you'll see us write these level two and level three questions, which is where we recommend spending most of the time. So we can ask students instead of just what's the setting, but let's combine setting and characters and ask how does the change in setting help us understand the characters key traits or maybe we're maybe our standard is setting so i'm going to use setting and character traits now i'm going to use setting and conflict so how does the setting help us understand the conflict in the story and then we can jump over to these level 3 questions which is using like the entire wheel or multiple boxes on the wheel or manipulating variables to play around with, well, what would happen if we changed one part of the story? So for example, how might the theme be different if we're told from a different point of view? And let's go through and let's justify this. Or how, what if the shift in, conf in conflict happened? How would the character respond? Would we think the same of the character? Or, you know, maybe we're looking specifically at figurative language. So how does, and so we just want to combine multiple boxes on the wheel. So how does the use of alliteration and symbolism interact to convey this theme of redemption? So I've used structure, um, and figurative language, symbolism, and theme together to help students really see and understand. And we write all these for you in the, les in the lesson, um, hopefully to make your job a little bit easier. And then what we would do, like if I were teaching this, this was one that's in the power unit. So maybe we would go through here and we might start off and we don't have time to go through like all like a full lesson with this, but we might write in, okay, what's the setting? And so as we read it, we would mark this and we would write it all down. But the key is to start drawing these arrows. And because that's the important piece you want. So you want to be able to ask students when reading this poem, which is about, um, we use it as part of the power of change and technology. It's, um, Spoiler alert, it's about a um, it's about a train, not a horse, like a lot of kids think. And so we may say, um, as we're looking at this, look at the repetition of and, and, and. So we would write this over here, but then we're going to draw an arrow maybe over to point of view to think how to say, well, how does this use of the word and all the time help us understand that this thing, this Brain. This new technology is here. It's constantly going. It's and it's and so we want to help students connect to those ideas. For example, um, and so you can see um, some other examples we have in our second and third grade units, we have a modified version of the wheel. And so you can see here, this is what it would look like in the classroom because you're constantly just drawing arrows and pointing and the students get really excited about it. And so this one comes from the great K-pop tree, which is in our ecology unit. And so we start off again, maybe asking those basic questions, but immediately moving and drawing arrows to talk about, for example, the setting in the rainforest and all the animals coming in to talk to this man, how does that help um, provide this idea of the tone or of, of, of the persuasion? And so what if it were in a different setting? 
And then you could also see we have another example where you could roll cubes to do the same thing if you want more interaction. So maybe you print off two different cubes and we have templates of these in the units also. So you might roll, like students may roll this cube and they may come up with character and setting and then they can start asking their own questions or looking at those links. Because again, this is what experts do. So how might the setting be different if the main character were changed or um, how would the, what if we pluck the character out and put them in a different setting? How would they react? And we want to help them start thinking about that. Um, another example that we have is we have rhetorical analysis wheels. This one you'll see mostly in the freedom unit or connected to social studies. And so pretty similar model in terms of how we would think about it, moving from those simple questions into um, the more complex. So here you can see um, for rhetorical analysis, we're asking students to analyze logos, ethos, and pathos, and then look at the techniques that the um, writer uses, the point of view, and then the structure and organization. So we might ask for example, what, how did, what was the structure organization of the text? So if we were using the 9-11 speech from um, Bush, then you know, we might say it was sort of problem solution. Then we might ask, so now let's connect that to ethos. And then we may say, so how does the switching of pronouns from us and we and I throughout as part of this structure help us understand part of the claim? Why would the author switch that? So we're starting to connect these together so students can see. So you'll notice a pattern. Every All of the models in the units are wheels, but where you can connect back and forth. We thought we were really smart by having, you know, like the center would be, you know, like everything sort of moved from the outside in. And, um, and then we had even created like these little um, paper plates, you know, and different like laminated wheels where the middle turn or the inner circle turns. And then you can actually look and play with all the connections. And we still use that and kids love it. But we also want to make sure that they understand there can be connections um, within the inner wheel and inner to outer also, because again, it's pretty complex when you really start to dig in to look at it. Um, this was our example for the primary wheel for textual analysis. So if they're reading nonfiction in the stories, we try to make sure in each unit there are um, fiction, nonfiction, as Joel said, you said media, et cetera. And so instead of looking at logos, ethos, pathos, it's almost the same, but in here we just have the supporting details because that's what more of on the inner wheel because that's what more elementary students need to know. Um, the social studies wheel is another one. So again, let's say that, actually this is a really fun one to play with with COVID. So if you think, if you just put like a problem or event, so if our event is a pandemic, well, what new innovation or technology happens as a result? How does this impact economics? What um, politics and power are going on at the moment? And what does that mean for how, um, you know, we're perceiving economics and um, vitality? How does this impact social structure? And so you can jump around and really start to help students dig deeply into an event. It's the same with like a famous person and you can do studies with that. And so instead of where were they born? Where did they die? What did they contribute? Let's dress up like them and, you know, repeat what they said in some kind of a speech. Let's ask them to talk about how did three different influences on the wheel um, impact who they are and why we're talking about them today. And so if we were, for example, you might um, playing around with 9-11 again, so we might read the speech, fill out the rhetorical analysis wheel with Bush, and then jump into the social studies wheel and actually examine the event. And so, you know, we might just ask some basic questions about economics or geography. Where was this? Why was this important? Um, culture, what role does culture play? But then we want to jump to those more complex questions again, where you're looking at which two factors on the wheel were most important in creating the conflict that ensued after.
culture or how did geography and culture influence the decisions that were made after this? So you can look at it in a lot of different ways. And again, these are written for you, but you need to sort of understand that basic premise as a jumping, as a jumping off point. We have science wheels, um, especially in the ecology unit um, for second and third grade is where those are first introduced. And it's an integrated science CLA. And so, you know, we might pose, pose some kind of a problem, like should we introduce um, new species to kill pests, to kill some kind of a pest. And so they would look at it and you'll notice right here in the center that these are the cross-cutting concepts for um, the next generation science standards, but the wheel follows the same idea. So if we're studying this problem, we might ask what models have been used in the past to combat it, but then we want to take models and jump to findings and solutions to add more complexity. So how might I model an idea or solution I have to um, show the impact this is going to have on a food web? And so you'll see a lot of different examples in the units looking at this also, we have the writing wheel that's in the second and third grade transformations unit. And um, again, once you understand, I think you um, the simple and complex, you'll it follows the same format. So I'm not go going to go into all of that. We have an argumentative writing wheel. We have a visual analysis wheel. But all of them, like the intent is to move from that simple to complex and to think about and so how to differentiate. So for some students, maybe, you know, what is the setting? If you're teaching, like if you're teaching gifted within a general classroom uh, and you're supposed to be focusing on setting, that's plenty. But for the kids who are ready, you can make it more complex by combining something else on the wheel, like how did the setting and point of view interact to help us understand the theme of bravery. So you can see sort of the on grade, whoops, sorry. Um, the on grade level potential standards and then how you can use that and use the wheel as a model for questioning and differentiation. Oh, that, that makes sense, Tamara. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me grab the screen back real quickly and do a couple of things. One is I wanna encourage everybody to please put questions down into the, uh, the Q&A box. Uh, we, uh, I love the folks that have asked questions. Everything's very substantive down there, uh, but feel free to add some uh, to that. Let me remind you guys, uh, those of you who joined us later or may not have seen this, uh, we have all of the, uh, we have a, a landing page essentially for the Vanderbilt materials. And if you would take a screenshot of this um, or, or write down that URL, I'm gonna leave it up for just a second here. Uh, and this, this page gives you a little introduction to the materials, but I also wanted to show you that on that page is also uh, a sample of one of the lessons. So if I come in here real quickly, this is where you would land that URL. If you'll come down here to the under unit features and click here, we give you a complete example of a uh, full example so you can see the kind of questioning that takes place, the kind of structure that the units have, the standards that it meets. Uh, and then you get down into, uh, there's even, you know, you get to the wheel. And, you know, I, Tamara, I know you, you have mentioned this before and I've seen you do it, is you can take these wheels and you can put a little, you could cut them out and then take a little pin and then you can move them around to, to create the questions and, and that sort of thing. But uh, it's a it's a wonderfully creative approach and and and, and uh, I think a lot of teachers would find this super useful. Um, uh, Tamara, let me let me ask this now that I've I've shown you know an example of, of one of the mm -hmm. lessons and shown people where they could download that from. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, just what would a, a lesson or unit arc look like? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so we try to make sure like the lessons and the models could stand alone in some, but we really work hard to make sure that the unit is not only integrated if we're using science or social studies or, um, you know, integration along with ELA, but we want to make sure that the um, that each lesson sort of builds on the other and so that it's getting it increasingly more challenging. And so, you know, before long, they're comparing multiple texts using, if you go back to Dr. Van Tasselbaska's integrated curriculum model as sort of the basis along with that development of expertise. So we've got our accelerated content through the harder pieces and we're, then we're using the wheels, but then we may also add in other resources. So I'm just going to give you couple of examples. So like a, if you're looking at a whole unit and then I'll break it down to the lesson um, 
down into a lesson, we have pre-post assessments. We think that's really important for that diagnostic prescriptive approach. So we ask questions to make sure our students able to see complex ideas within ELA or science. Are they able to interpret? Are they able to look at and identify concepts um, within a within the unit? And so those are so typically there are four questions where we're looking at evidence, inference, inner actions and um, and concepts. And um, there are rubrics for those as well. And then typically there are 12 lessons, but that doesn't mean it's 12 days of instruction. One lesson could take three or four days to teach. And then lesson 12 is always some kind of a culminating project. And you'll see there are lots of choices within the um, unit for what the projects might be because we believe choice is important, but its choice isn't differentiated unless you add in the complexity to make it differentiated. So we try to combine both. Then an individual lesson format, we're gonna start off with an introductory hook or a real world problem or some kind of a quick debate, going into that depth idea um, that, or the definition of depth that I talked about. And then you're going to have a section on in-class activities to deepen learning. That's where we're gonna get the wheels, the processes of thinking like an expert. And it may be, Sometimes it's an art piece, sometimes it's um, a YouTube video, sometimes it is um, a picture book, it just varies. Or sometimes it's a simulation in science that we might look at. And then we're going to have choice-based differentiated products. And those are products that we that you could have students pick one. We wouldn't ask to please don't ask students to do all four or five that we give you examples of. These are more for you as a teacher to pick the ones that best fit your students' needs or even maybe to specifically assign or give them choices. And so those are more um, the products that you can use to assess, did they get the crux of the lesson or the objectives of the lesson? Then we have sort of these extensions, these opportunities for talent development. For students who are really interested in it, you can provide them ways to go sort of off the page or off the unit unit in some similar areas of study. And then we have a social emotional connection. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. Um, and then there's always some kind of an ELA um, specific task, um, a link back to the big ideas or concepts. And those are all the titles of each lesson or each unit. So for example, if you see like interactions in the title of one unit, you know that's going to be the concept. If you see truth versus percept, you know, truth, that's going to be the concept for each of the units. And then there's usually some kind of an assessment or an exit ticket. That's one of those really short formative um, assessments that you can use. So in general, we have, you know, we are going to start up here with these concepts and generalizations and specific, and I'll show you what this means a little bit more in a minute. And then these debatable questions, like what would a scientist or what in this case, this is interactions in ecology, what would an ecologist think about within this, you know, what debatable issues would they be dealing with? And that's what we want students to start playing with early. And so then we're looking at these topics um, that we were playing with as a result. And then we have um, ex the accelerated resources that we're using. So you might see art, picture books, novels, our advanced models for developing expertise. Those are the wheels and cubes that we just talked about. And then we're going to see these differentiated products and connections to multicultural, social, emotional um, and other assessments. And you'll see here this idea of that and and. You'll, a lot of our differentiated project choices use the words that and and because I found that that's a really easy way to add the criteria and the complexity. So instead of just saying um, rewrite the story in another point of view, rewrite the story in a way that um, incorporates the interaction between point of view and setting and uses the same theme. So the idea of that and and is really important. And you'll see that pattern in a lot of our differentiated products so that we make sure if we're teaching in a complex way, we're asking students to actually report out in a complex way. So what that might look like as sort of an arc you know, that Joel asked about 
is, you know, like, let's say this is in the ecology unit. So they might read the great Kapok tree as a picture book. They're going to start off with a quick debate. Should we cut down trees for shelter? And they might walk, you know, like on different sides of the room and have the conversation, but they, um, may not know a lot about it just yet. So what they will do is they may fill out a literary analysis wheel and really dig deeply into the great K-pop tree. Then in the same lesson, um, so they've got this book, then they might read different perspectives on deforestation, what's good about it, what's not good about it. So they have these two different perspectives, complete a textual analysis wheel, and then come back and then answer this question one more time using the evidence that um, has been provided. And then they might from there use that as a jumping point. And then less, the next lesson might be a simulation or a video on food webs and food chains and what happens um, within different systems as we examine um, the science piece of the book. Um, here's another example, then another lesson, they're reading the novel, The One and Only Ivan, and then they're looking at videos on the benefits and liabilities of having animals in a zoo, which if you know The One and Only Ivan, which is an amazing book, um, dovetails nicely. But then the big debatable question of an expert is should animals be kept in their natural habitats? And um, then they would look at some information on that. And then they may move on to um, looking at a video on the overpopulation of wild boars. And wild boars don't have um, a predator. And so they're overpopulating, they're eating a lot of plants. And so should, inter should humans intervene to stop the overpopulation of species? So then they might read a poem on the circle of life and use a literary analysis wheel. And then they're gonna go back and they're gonna study more science on um, like simulations and videos uh, on food webs and food chains and what happens when animals don't have a predator to then go back and answer this question. And so you'll see the units are sort of, or the lessons have a lot of information in them to take you two or three days, but also to pick what you, you know, what you think is best within your standards. And then you can see down here, we might have some kind of a, this is one example of a choice-based assessment, create a presentation brochure, advertisement, commercial or poster for your community that expresses your position on a topic of interest um, from a debate used in this unit. And then think about who would agree or disagree. Um, and then here are a few examples that they could pick from, such as should new species be introduced into the environment? Should humans play a role in controlling the animal population? So students would have amassed enough information over the course of the unit to do this as a culminating activity. Um, and then we have, you know, we talked about the importance of concepts and how um, experts are able to make these generalizations um, with the facts that are presented. So we this um, in the same unit, the concept is interactions. So they might read the great Kapok tree and under the concept section of each lesson, they're going to fill out a chart that looks something like this. So interactions are inevitable. What were the inevitable interactions that happened as a result of a man thinking about um, wanting to cut down the tree and the animals coming to try to convince them of otherwise. So students would write in facts in each of these. Um, there's a simulation in here that students use to look at what happens um, when they add or take away plants and add a, new animals into an environment. And so they would use that science simulation also to link back to these concepts. And then the unit also has some videos that they're watching on food webs. Um, they're reading a novel and then they're doing a biography study and a self-reflection and thinking about interactions in themselves and um, how they interact with other people. And so all of those would be linked back to these key concepts and ideas. And then they might create a piece of art about ecosystems. Notice that that in the end, that shows how interactions among um, various elements in the art are there and in the environment and how those two interact to produce change. So this is just sort of, this is um, just so shows you pictorially what we've already talked about. Um, so you have, so they might work on the great k pop tree, then they may take that as a jumping off point to think about um, 
like this problem that should they be able to build a pond over top of um, a swampy area because they need a new gymnasium for their school for kids to play. So what are you supposed to do about this? And so they might fill out the science wheel after they've gone through and conducted some simulations. And then there are some lessons that in addition to the social emotional connection, which for the great K-pop tree, um, one of the questions is what happens when you feel conflicted because somebody wants you to do something that, you know, and you end up having to change their mind or let them down, which was something that happened when the man changed his mind and didn't ended up not cutting down the tree. So we have specific ones to the lesson, but we all, um, also have lessons that focus specifically on social emotional needs, especially at the younger grades. So like if we have, um, so we're looking at this concept of interactions, students might read um, two amazing picture books by Jacqueline Woodson and talk about how do interactions help us build positive relationships. And these also pull in some really great multicultural literature to look at this idea of mirrors and windows. And in one, um, the other side, it's a student, um, oh, two girls, one's white and one is black and they um, are on opposite sides of the fence and they want to become friends. And so, you know, looking, and so it's an amazing book of thinking about interactions with other individuals. And then we have um, some videos that they, they look at Kid President, they look at the Buddy Bench. And so again, just thinking about how do we make our world a better place? They've looked at it through the ecology and science, but what about the ecology, like just a people, you know, like, and, and, and our world and the systems and interactions that are there. So then they listen to get back up again from trolls and try everything from Zootopia, and then start to look at their own interactions and um, within themselves. And then um, as Another way to think about it, so that was an elementary example of sort of an entire unit arc in sort of a lesson arc. This one comes from the truth versus perception unit. And so we might start out with this idea of concept development. So we have that introductory lesson or hook. So on truth versus perception, we might ask students to start off with a quick debate and ask them, is it best to know the truth? Do you agree or disagree? They might talk about that. Then truth is reality. Go back and forth. What do you think? And we would ask them to stand on different sides of the room and, and have that conversation. Then we might show if y'all know if y'all are familiar with the dress and it, you know, what do you see here? Do you see blue and black? Do you see gold and white? Do you see something different? And so is there a truth? Is there a real color here, even though we see something different? And so we might um, talk to them about that. Then we might ask them, ignorance is bliss. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Stand on different sides of the room. And then um, after that, we would ask them, based on what we did, come up with three true statements about truth and perception and the interaction between the two. And then we would show them these generalizations as part of the concept that's going to lead through the entire unit. Um, interactions um, does the same thing um, you know, with lesson one. And so then after students do that, then they might look at um, Plato's allegory of the cave. And they might read that looking at um, at truth versus perception. And so you see, you have the prison, the chain prisoners, and then the free prisoners go out and they realize that the shadows that were cast on the wall, there's, that's not the real thing. They walk outside into the light and they actually see what's um, producing the shadows. And so then from there, we might ask a debatable question, is perception reality based on this reading? So we have the chained prisoners and the freed prisoners, and we talk about that as part of a debatable question. Then they might look, now we're going to show you this painting by Escher. They might fill out a visual um, analysis wheel. And then we would ask them to go back in. Now let's compare the true, the two, because now we have two different perceptions here of this or two different perspectives. So what would Escher say about whether or not perception is reality? What would Plato say? And is there any way, anywhere where they would be overlapping? And then they might go in and again, every unit has that concept piece where we might write Plato's allegory of the cave here, Escher here, and then have students write down their specific examples that go along with it. So that again, each lesson ties together. Um, actually, I can go into research now, but 
Yeah, but that's kind of the, that's the arc. And so, you know, again, while they could stand alone, we really do want the lessons to try to build on each other and increase in difficulty. Yeah, and Tamara, um, I, I, let me ask you to do something. I, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the research, yeah. uh, please. But all, uh, um, also, I want to have time for the questions. So um, uh, I'd, I'd like if, if you could kind of summarize the, the, the research that supports the, the use of the materials. Absolutely. And um, so we have one thing that we know, there's sort of a conceptual um, part of the research and then the very specific piloting of the units research. And so, you know, we one thing we know just from the work of um, Dr. Van Tassel Baskin using the integrated curriculum model is that the use of the same models over three years results in higher level critical thinking and content acquisition. And so, you know, what we want to do is that's where you'll see like the same wheels in multiple units because we want students to start to internalize that. And we know that that works based on the use from other curriculum models. I've already talked about how they're vetted by content experts. And so there's that content validity that comes as a result of thinking like an expert and then the theoretical model. So that's sort of that model conceptual part. And also knowing that, you know, using the integrated curriculum model and the research that's come out of um, Dr. Van Tassel Baska's work, trying to use that conceptual frame, you know, with the development of expertise um, also adds to this. And then as far as the units themselves, they've been piloted with sample sizes from up 46 teachers up to 120 teachers, um, depending on the unit. And in each unit, I just grabbed this one, um, you'll see in the front matter, we have all of the information um, about it. And there's a section that talks about, I don't know if you can see that very well, but it says evidence support for the unit. And it will give you whether you want it or not, like the actual statistical significance from the pilot pre-post assessments and you know the um, F values and the effect sizes, which in different units range anywhere from 0.8 to 1.6. Um, in terms of their effect size after controlling for dependence. And then we also ask, we change our units a lot after we've had teachers pilot them and make sure that, you know, they are engaging and that they make sense. And most of the time the teachers have said, you know, what they love about it is the students get really excited about it. It's engaging for um, students. It's fun to teach. And the, um, like the quote, that I think we hear the most is its complexity made easy. It helps, you know, you have this model to ask your own questions and also to get students thinking um, about the text or the prompts in ways that you want them to. Oh, thanks, Tamara. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, we've got time for questions, and you guys have done such a great job of, of throwing up some questions. I, I'm going to, uh, I hadn't actually intended to do this, but before Stephanie gets started, let me let me mention uh, one little uh, thing about what we're doing. If you go to the Proof Rock Press homepage, uh, scroll down to this COVID-19 uh, support area. If you need access to these materials in an online uh, format, like if you're using it as part of your learning management system, uh, something like that. Uh, we are working with schools and school districts to uh, allow for that. Uh, we can we can do everything from give you permission to you know uh, scan a couple of pages to we can provide a, a PDF that's you know uh, specific to your school district. Uh, you just need to go to this this link here, visit our permissions homepage. You can request the materials that you might need uh, if you are teaching from home and, and you've got uh, kids who are remote. So uh, that shouldn't be an obstacle. We will work with you to help uh, help you do that. Uh, Stephanie, let me let me bring I, I bring you in and, and uh, have you kind of sort of answer or, or bring up some of the questions that have, have come up in the Q&A. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so our first one is from a GT campus teacher slash coordinator who says, the one question teachers have is how to differentiate for GT kids. Is there a good differentiation template that I can teach them how to use effectively? Yeah, that's a great question. And so um, because the units were designed already as um, you, starting with accelerated standards, I would start off with the complexity, the um, more complex, the level two and level three questions first as part of differentiation and then go back down if you need to. So let them start immediately with some of the interactions um, if you feel that they're ready for them. And so also... 
I think um, you could also substitute some of the um, readings if you felt like they needed to be more or less challenging. But I think what happens a lot of times is we focus or at least what I've heard from other teachers and what I've observed in classrooms is we focus so much on those simple questions of filling in the wheel that then we run out of time for the interactions, which is where most of the differentiation can happen with those tiered assignments. And then you can even target um, certain questions to certain students based on those more complex level two and level three questions. Great, that's helpful. Yeah, um, we also had a question about um, Someone who really liked the I, me, you, we, sorry, I, me, you, we, yes, yeah. units, um, yeah. but is 100% remote now. And um, Joel did show us um, some options for um, uh, licensing if needed, but do you have any other thoughts for um, teaching online? Any other ways to adapt the content? I do. I'm actually, I thought this question might come up. And so I actually, I wanted to share just, oh, let me see if I can get there. Um, so one of the ways that there are a couple of things, I'm going to go back here first, and then I can show you what I've done. Um, so you can use shared documents to sketch or jot down responses and even use, um, if you're able to um, use different chat rooms and put students in breakout rooms. You could even differentiate the questions. What I like to do though, is put something on a Google, like put the wheel, um, even like, and I'll recreate it myself and put that on a Google doc. And then I'm just going to show you real quick what that might look like. Um, I'm probably going to have to, let's see. Oh, I stopped screen sharing. Let me try it again. Can you all see that now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah. So like what I may do, so like I would have all of this sort of preset. So I've got these little text boxes. So then I can pull it over and then students can start writing what they think in each text box. And then I have a whole bunch of arrows kind of pre-made because it's kind of hard sometimes to do online. So then with the students can even start in a shared doc, you know, start taking the arrows and saying, you know, like if, um, if there's a symbol of the frog, you know, and so how does that lead to this idea of, um, you know, the character? And so then they can start writing in these different ideas and students can do that or that's a way for you to do it and model it. And then what I would do is I would go back and I would then assign like your differentiated questions. You could also ask the more complex questions on discussion boards. And so that students can talk about it before they come back to the classroom and you can see what they're thinking. And then you can sort of troubleshoot where you saw there were misconceptions. Um, and then I would definitely do like that whole group, small group, whole group as much as you can, depending on whether you're synchronous or you know, asynchronous most of the time. But if you could get everybody together, put them off in those small um, chat rooms, breakout rooms or discussion boards with their shared Google Doc and the wheel or the questions they need to answer and have them type them down. And then you come back together, show that on the screen and look at it. Um, most, I found most teachers have been really excited and found that to be like an effective way to at least begin to launch it. Great. That makes sense. You know, I, I'd also add, Tamara, that one of the things that, that your materials, and this is also true of the, the Jacob's Ladder materials that you've developed, are very, de they, they are dependent upon that math, the, I guess, the, I want to think of a master juggler or something, the teacher, because, it, you know, the, the, there is no single answer. What's going to happen right. is a kid proposes an answer, and then there's an evolution of that answer and a discussion and an extension, and that's where the differentiation comes into play and, and all of that. And that can happen, you know, online, in chat boards, in Google Docs. It can happen in a classroom. I mean, it, it's, but it, it, it's an interaction. It's not just an answer that gets written down and, and delivered, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. No, so it's very discussion based. You know, you know, like, and there is there's a lot of interaction is expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of uh, building off of that, um, can these units be adapted to situations with only one child, like homeschooling or remote families? 
Um, they can, it would be nice if they had a friend though, but of course they can. And so, you know, like a lot of times I know um, some homeschool families will, you know, like they'll use the wheel and they'll fill it, fill it out. And I mean, it's really fun. You can do this in the classroom, you know, two once if you're working with your kids in person, but make a really big wheel and use string, you know, and like, and ask the student, let's take the string and let's link it. What do you, you know, like, how do you see this relationship to this one. So you can still ask the questions and use them with one student. It is helpful though, if sometimes you can find at least another friend that they could talk to about the content, but it's not necessary. The only thing I would caution you against is just giving them the list of questions and products as the worksheet. You know, you want to, if you're homeschooling or you're working with one student, you want to be the one to engage with them and have the conversations and help prod those complex questions. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we also got a question about standards. Uh, what common core standards do you use? Do they vary from state to state? Yeah, so we're using the um, the common core standards that um, you know that have been that have been pushed out from um, the, from well, just the CCS. Us, um, standards. And we know some states have adopted or adapted different pieces of them, but we feel like that's probably the most common because I know even in Tennessee, we don't use exactly the common core, but there's so much overlap, especially in um, ELA, that that seemed to make the most sense. And so my guess is if you look, we have standards alignment in the appendices of each book. If you look there, my guess is you'll see something very similar to what you're state would have if your state isn't a common core state. Great. Um, we also got a question about uh, students who are gifted in science. Mm -hmm. um, so how would one teach students who are gifted in science, especially biology, and help them develop their talents with the present restrictions? Um, yeah. <sighs> yeah. It, it's, I, first of all, my hats are my hand is off to all of you because I know like where it, how how challenging um, you know, that is just in when you're already in your normal routine, let alone now. Um, in the units that we have, one of the things that I was very purposeful of doing was making sure that there were standalone science lessons that um, integrated with what we were doing in ELA. Because what happens sometimes is if we integrate science and ELA in the same lesson, so a lot of times, especially at the elementary level, the science would get lost. And so you would, can see those standalone lessons that you could pull. And a lot of, like in the ecology unit, there are simulations, well, and actually in space story structure as well, but the ecology unit probably links closest to biology and, um, or could add, you could add that component. And so from there, like you could have them do a simulation by themselves um, and then come back and answer answer the questions and then talk through it in a more complex way. Or maybe you help them come up with one of the choice-based differentiated projects that are there as an extension or one of the talent development extensions. And then they could, you know, complete the wheel or do a little bit, um, do a little bit more investigating on their own with the teacher of gifted as part of their regular assignment. Um, I usually discourage full independent study because I, I hope that, you know, the products are complex enough that they really need that more knowledgeable other to have that conversation with, and then they can go off on their own and do a little bit. But I would definitely encourage you to look at those choice-based products and the wheels and those standalone science lessons and pull those out and maybe just magnify those for the student. Great. Um... So we also got a question about assessment. Um, how does assessment work in your curriculum planning? Can you differentiate that as well for students so everyone's getting relevant feedback? Yeah, I think, and so I think um, there in each of the units, you'll see like different assessments. And so there are exit tickets and you can adjust, um, I'm trying to find like there's one example like of an exit ticket where you could just take off like it's a for is for younger kids and it's fill in the blank you could take off the second half of the more complex piece you know sort of that that in the and take off the and part and just have them fill out that first piece if you wanted to differentiate it that way or you could also use the questions in each individual lesson because we give you simple 
and complex. So you can differentiate your assessment by maybe picking a more simple question that you would ask um, some students that would be more on grade level or more complex for those who are ready for it. And then the pre post assessment, you can also use be, um, as more of that global diagnostic prescriptive approach, because you know each question links with a specific um, portion of the unit. So there's a concept question. And so it maybe if the students didn't do as well on that one, you might want to give them more concept questions within each lesson to help build that up. Or there, and then there's like the interaction among different variables, which is sort of the wheel question. And so you could focus more on that and hone in on that for certain students who need that. So just use each question in the rubric and the rubric tells you what it's matched to so that you can differentiate. And Stephanie, maybe maybe just one more question. We're we're running short on time, please. Uh, sure. Um, how can we use these units uh, if our district requires teachers to use a certain curriculum? Um, are they okay as standalone lessons? Um, they are. I think you could do that. I think that there's strength in the way in the way we piloted it. We asked teachers and to get the effect sizes that we talked about, which are you know like a good year's worth of growth. Um, you would want we used um, at four different lessons that incorporated um, a couple of wheels, a debatable question, and a concept. And so that we, because we didn't ask the teachers to teach the entire unit when we piloted it and to get our data. So as long as you're using the wheels with the complex questions, um, hopefully you know, you'll see some similar gains as to what we did. Um, and, you know, and some teachers will even just use the wheels as a model, use a couple of lessons as examples, and then plug in their own, you know, maybe you have to teach this short story, and you can plug in that short story with um, the models that are already there. Yeah, and Tamara, I, I said that was the last question, but I, I wanted to get to, to one, one question that was in there that I thought, oh, I, I, the, the, most of the readings and the materials could, could easily be used in a general education program. The, the real differentiation here is the depth and complexity of the questioning and the exploration that the kids are doing. Am, am I right in saying that? Um, to a certain extent, we did try to select um, read a, like stories that were um, on a readability level, a couple grade levels above, or we tried if they weren't, if they were right on grade level, like the great K-pop tree, you know, for second and third, that's not accelerated, but the concepts and the way we're talking about it are, but we tried to have um, as many of you like we try to have advanced questions with advanced content, but we do know some teachers who are using it in the general classroom and just scaffolding down a little bit as needed or sometimes substituting a story that they have to read for everybody on grade level, but using the stories in the unit as the more advanced one. So I think it also depends on your context um, as, and how advanced your students are. Oh, that yeah, yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. Well, well, Stephanie, thank you so much for for handling the Q and A. I I really do appreciate it. Uh, Tamara, thank you so much for your valuable time. I I uh, genuinely appreciate you coming in. You've done two of two of these webinars this season, and and uh, it's it's been a delight. Thank thank you so much for all the the, the heavy lifting and and the, the preparing these webinars for us. I, I sure do appreciate it. Thank you. And have fun, just have fun with them. Thanks. I, and I, I appreciate you know, the work with Proof Rock, but these are really fun and I hope you enjoy it. Just play around with the wheels and, you know, I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any as you dive in. Fantastic. And I, I tell you what, at the, at the end here, let me, let me put up Tamara's, um, Tamara's contact information. Uh, give me just a second to pull that up. And uh, that way you guys, if you have any questions for Tamara, um, feel free to take a screenshot of this and, uh, uh, send her any questions that you uh, might have. And I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today. I know how busy everyone is and how, how crazy things are right now with everything going on. It's just a delight to have you guys come in and uh, spend an hour with us. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.